Eight months. All right. 18 years. Good job. Brand new. Two months. Two months. Okay. So that's the exciting part about the vision therapy community is we are always having newer people come in and we always have people that are changing, you know, throughout, but every single one of us doesn't matter if you're brand new or if you've been here for years. Um, our goal is we're always learning, right? So neuroplasticity, we believe that the brain can be changed. And so that's how we do our job. But at the same time, it means that our brain can be changed. And so how we learn um, different verbiage, different ideas. So when I go around the country and I'm training inside clinics, one of the things I, I want to stress is everything that I try to show you or we talk about or discuss about no way is it saying that what you've done previously is wrong or that you need really even need to change anything. These are just different ways that I have found that have been successful. And so you'll find out what is very successful for you. And then it's very important that as the therapist, you're always working underneath your doctor's supervision. Okay. So how you do things in your clinic, a lot of it will be guided by how your doctor wants you to do that. So I do want to start out um oh good somebody's going through the training course now wonderful so one thing i want to start out is this series is really not um to teach or to, um someone how to do self-therapy or to be any type of medical advice for somebody that's trying to treat a certain condition um that's always through your local optometrist or and your local doctor so if there's anybody that is joining us that is not a vision therapist are not under a vision therapist or not a doctor this training is pretty much um not not really intended for you it is intended exactly for therapists that are serving underneath doctors or any doctors that may be joining us if you are a doctor joining us please let me know too i, I appreciate all our doctors that give us such great support so that being said, if anything comes up, you're welcome to put questions in. Also, most of you know my email. You can always email me afterwards. And then hopefully next time we'll be able to have some video chat and we'll also be able to do here. So excellent. So we have one OD so far. So we're continuing with foundations of fusion. And so we're talking about motor alignment. And so we're going to go down and just a little bit of a recap. Um, today is going to be not real long, so hopefully we'll be able to give you some ideas or some thoughts to it. So the recap from last session. So one of the things that I always want to stress is fusions our goal, right? We want them to have good stereopsis. We want them to be able to not only have great global fusion, okay, but as we work that magnocellular, we work towards the parvo, and then now we've been able to get red-green luster, polymer, maybe expanded vectograms blown up like on a silver screen, and we, those of you that use the VTS-4, we've used the big dog and ring, and now we're coming in and we want to get to where they have good central fusion, and that way they have total total binocular vision, okay? But fusion will only be as strong as the weakest step, okay? So everything that we do, it's not just linear, okay? You'll hear me repeat that a lot, okay? It's not we just do this activity and then we go to this activity and this thought and that thought and this means, all right? So therapy always has this, this spiral effect, or if you want to think about it going up this direction, and it always loops back upon itself, okay? And it's important because what are all the things that we have to have for fusion? Well, we think there has to be ocular motors. They have to have fixation, right? They've got to be able to look at something. They're going to have to have eye alignment, okay? They're going to have to get those cameras to the right place. So all these different things are working together. And last week we talked about luster, okay, and why we start with luster. And so recapping that, we're engaging the connection between both eyes and the brain and the involvement of fusion, right? Because the cameras, the eyes themselves, all they do is pick up light, okay? So they're picking up light and they're transferring it through the retina, through the optic nerve, into the brain, but the brain is what sees, okay? So we've got to get the brain's involvement. The red-green luster allows that 
backdoor communication process into the brain is very peripheral, very magna, so you, you don't have the chances of creating diplopia, but it's also that gross fusion that's gonna hold everything together and get both eyes communicating, okay? So very important, that's why we kind of start with that. But now as we're going towards this greater control, greater amount of fusion, understanding depth, stereopsis, and localization of fusion, now we've got to enter in to what does what's required okay so in fusion we talk about sensory fusion okay the brain has to put both images together but we also have to have what's called motor alignment okay so it's getting the eyes to align together okay so just kind of a refresher ocular motor those of you that are brand new first thing of ocular motor is fixation can they sit there and if you have a, a target, say it's a wolf one or um, for little kids, I'll use finger puppets, you know, whatever I can to get them to, to look at one stationary object. So can they get their eye? And this can be done monocularly. It can be done binocularly. But basically, can they get their eye to sit to where that object is being the image of that object is being put onto their macula and their phobia and so that they're able to get a clear, concise picture. Now, in fixation, we need to know that we always have just a little bit of movement within the eye. That's a refresher. So back there on those retinal cells, if they were just to hold that perfectly still, those um, cells would become saturated and they would lose their ability to hold that fixation or hold that picture. So there is a little bit of movement that's going on that it's refreshing and keeping it, but totally keeping within that area on that, thing, on that target that you're having them, that's fixation, okay? Pursuits is if the object is moving, okay? So if the object is moving, can they keep their eyes on it? We're not gonna go back through, but doctors, you'll be able to explain to your therapists, we're looking for head movement, we're looking for jerkiness, we're looking for loss of fixation, okay? So being able to pursue through space, and then saccades, if we have two separate objects, can they go from one to the other, one to the other, okay? So making two fixations separated by a ballistic eye movement, okay, a saccade. So reading, reading is a great example, okay? So, a motor alignment is the ability now to get these two cameras, okay, whether they're, you're doing a fixation, a pursuit, or a saccade, getting both cameras the ability to point in the location in space, whether it's on the X, Y axis, okay, or if it's on the Z axis, okay, so there would bring forth vergences, convergence and divergence to the right location in space where it is necessary for sensory fusion to take place, okay? So it's all about getting the cameras where they need to be so that the brain can be able to make the best fusional completion, okay? There are some activities that um, before I get into what I'm gonna talk about today, um, mainly we're gonna be talking about a little bit about um, FISDIP and then about Brock string. So some previous activities, if I'm building up to this, this wouldn't be something I would do the first session. So I've already, with this patient that we're gonna be kind of thinking about, I've already done a lot of ocular motor activities. I've already done eye stretches. Why? Because I want that range of motion, okay? I want that ability of them feeling what it means to move their eye to the up position, down position, right, left all those different things. Um, also, we've worked fixation, right? We need to make sure that they're able to get that image where they want it. We've worked maples doubles where they've had a central target and paying attention to a peripheral target or being able to use pursuits and then saccades bouncing from one to the other. So we've already worked a lot of ocular motor activities. Um, I've done these probably monocularly and then I've already probably done these binocularly, okay? We've worked our luster activities, using the whiteboard, using the balloon, or kind of combination you can see in the picture down here. Um, we'll take these anti-suppression, red-green canceling paper um, plates and put them out on the floor, and then they have to toss bean bags onto them as they tell me what they see on them so that I know that they're not suppressing. 
I've also done some binocularity control uh, or bilateral conditioning. More often than not, if you have a child that has poor vergences or poor ocular motor, they probably have low muscle tone and poor body control all the way, way across. Now, every time that we make a statement like that, there's always the exception. But overall, you'll find that if somebody has very poor ocular motor skills, they probably have very poor muscular control already. So doing crawling, bean bags, and then I like to use the Marson ball, just that swinging back and forth. And one of the videos that we're hoping to do one of these days is all the activities that I do with a Marson ball. So I won't go through those right now. But the main one is just that perception as that ball is coming towards them and that ball is coming away from them. Do they recognize the feeling of their eyes coming in converging? Do they recognize the feeling of their eyes going out diverging? Do they recognize the compression of space as that ball is coming towards them? And then also in their periphery, as that ball is coming towards them and their eyes are converging in and they feel the compression of space coming in this direction, they should also feel that, that compression of space in their periphery as they're coming in closer and closer. So working on those activities before we get to this. So at the beginning of this alignment, okay, so I'm really working on alignment. The first thing I use is my little magic wands, okay? So I call them my magic wands. They're wolf wands, okay? Doctors have these. They use them in the exam lane. And therapists, go to your doctors and ask them for, for Christmas or something because these two little things are wonderful to use, okay? Um, they're fixation targets. They're pursuit targets. They're saccadic targets. They're all sorts of different things. So one of the things when we're working towards getting motor alignment Remember, there's different stages of, of diagnosis, different things that you're going to work with. Today, I'm concentrating more on those that maybe have just a, more of a simple binocularity function, dysfunction. Maybe they're a CI convergence insufficiency or convergence excess. When we start getting into your exotropes and your esotropes, there are some other things that I would be doing above and beyond this, um, one of which which is especially with my esotropes, I use the OKN drum quite a bit just to make sure that I, I have that ability to get nystagmus as they're going temporal and also nystagmus as they're coming in nasal. And so that I know that they have the neural connectivity to be able to fire those muscles coming out. But um, even with my esotropes, I'll, be, I'll, I'll show you some of the things that we're gonna be doing. But this is mainly for any anybody um, that I, I can get both eyes working together, okay? So with just a simple wand, one of the things that you want to make, make sure that you can do before you do the motor alignment is really understand where their centration point is, especially if they're an esotrope. So I will even patch one eye. I use the clear patch so that I can see their eye behind. And I'm going to hold this up, but basically I take it and it's kind of hard to do, you know, kind of look at it as, as I'm talking to you. But what I want them to do is I find the distance, okay, I find the place that as I'm bringing this across, that both eyes begin to pair together. So if you have an, somebody that is an esotrope, um, you can find a place where both eyes just begin to move together, okay? That's really important because things that fire together, wire together, things that are wired together, fire together, okay? So if I can make sure that I'm working motor alignment in the space where they're already preconditioned to work together, then I'm helping myself. If I'm outside of that, then they're not used to working those together. There's nothing that's firing together. They're, they're only limiting to that one eye. So trying to find that place that I can use both eyes working together. So basically bringing them in, bringing them across, making sure that both eyes are tracking together, okay? So we're doing all this on the left and right axis, okay? And then the vertical axis going up and down. So can I find both eyes going up? Can I get both eyes going down? 
This is a little bit different than eye stretching. Eye stretching, I'm just looking for range of motion. This is more is, is it working together? Are they moving their eyes simultaneously or is there lag on either side of their eyes? Secondly, physiological diplopia, okay? So this is great. Um, it's called FISDIP for short, or brain doubling. Um, here's kind of a, a way that you can think about it is in binocular, also referred to as fusion. It refers to the simultaneous perception of information from the right eye and the left eye organized into a single precept, okay? Binocularity occurs in the brain, not the retina, okay? So now double vision indicates a dysfunction of this binocular system, okay? But physiological diplopia, and unfortunately, I'm not sure why, but in, in Demio, all my movement or all my videos, it doesn't do it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So I'm hoping that the new platform will change. But most of you will know what FISDIP or physiological diplopia is. For those that you don't, you can do this with just your finger or, or with a pencil or anything. But if I'm looking at the target, both cameras are aligned to one single point. That's where I'm having fusion. So I should have one. But if I look past the target, okay, so I'm looking beyond, I still have a right camera and a left camera, a right eye and a left eye that are picking up information in front of the place that I'm looking at, okay? So that's going to see two images. That's physiological diplopia. It's brain doubling. It's recognizing that there's two images in front of where I'm actually fusing into a single precept. This is important because it tells us, one, are they suppressing, okay? If that one eye, if they are looking past it, but they're only seeing one in front, we know that either the left eye, the right eye is suppressing, and we're not going to get fusion. We're not going to get sensory fusion if we're only using one eye. Um, we can also do it the other way, where we hold this out farther, and maybe we have one in, and so they're looking at the gold one that is closer to them. And then if they do that, then the silver one that is farther is going to be doubled, okay? So we can have FISDIP when we're looking in front converging, and anything that is beyond that would be doubled, or we can have it in divergent state where everything in front of where we're looking would be doubled, okay? So physiological diplopia is just a recogniz recognition tool, okay? So do they recognize that they're looking past or do they recognize that they're looking in front and then do they recognize that their eyes are still on and that they're having that 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 fusion or having that simultaneous perception um both ways okay so that 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 ability to see okay so hit the wrong button there all right so one of the greatest tools for motor alignment is the Brock string, okay? So just very, very simple, simple string, right? All it is is a piece of string. This is paracord, and then it has, you know, beads, right? Green bead, yellow bead, red bead. Ours is actually glow-in-the-dark, so it has glow-in-the-dark string, and then it has glow-in-the-dark beads. But very, very simple. And those of you that are brand new to vision therapy, I will tell you that when I started out, this string scared me. Like, I was like, what, how in the world does that do anything? And I didn't really understand it. I didn't understand the power of it. I didn't understand the application of it. But I am firmly convinced, and I've told people this, if, if I was to be dropped somewhere on an on a island, you know, shipwrecked, and on that island, um, there's only one tribe, and half of the tribe was isotropes, half of the tribe was exotropes. And the only way they would let me live on the island and let me eat um, was if I tra treated them and cured them. And as long as I had a Brock string and then something that I could make, you know, a stick or something like that, um, really I could do a lot. I could do a lot to help them. So if you're brand new to vision therapy, 
please talk to your doctor, talk to um, other therapists that you know, those that have been around a while and really get to understand what this Brock string does and how it works because it will make your therapy much more productive and easier if you can master this, okay? Um, it is one of the most foundational binocular activities. It's very helpful. It gives great examples on how the binocular system is functioning. Um, I think of it as a helpful resource when learning or teaching a patient how to think about their binocular system. So this is a great therapy tool. It's also a great diagnostic tool, okay? When you first use this with a patient, you and the patient are going to find out so much more about their binocular system than you would pretty much any other way, okay? It's really going to give you some great feedback. So the Brock string um, is held, and you can, I'm, I'm hopeful that most people have known this. If you've taken the emergent course, you'll see we have a, a, a course on it. But some people hold it to the chin, some people bring it up to their nose. To me, it's whatever is comfortable to them. I tend to have them hold it right underneath their nose because it seems to have a little bit better alignment. And then the patient should be able to look at the bead and be prompted to notice that the bead is single and that the other beads to be paired double. So here brings back that fizz dip, but instead of using the wands, now we're using a string with beads, okay? The patient should also notice that there appears to be two strings and which form something of an X shape wherever the eyes are pointed. So let's kind of look at that, okay? The patient should then attempt to move their X from one bead to another along the string and should be able to do so easily with relative efficiency, noticing diplopia of the other two at the same time. So if I'm the patient and I'm holding this up and I'm gonna try to do it facing you can, so that you can see the best. So I'm holding it to my nose. If I'm looking at the middle bead, which is that yellow bead, okay? then I should expect that that yellow bead be single because I'm aligning both eyes to that particular bead. But at the same time, I should also be able to recognize that the green bead, which is in front, and the red bead that is in back is doubling, okay? So that wherever I have motor alignment, that's where I have fusion. Outside of that is where I have phys dip or physiological diplopia. And so, you can kind of see in the pictures down here, um, the picture here, they're looking at the green bead, okay? They have two strings, one coming from the right eye, one coming from the left, okay? They're fused or they're holding motor alignment on the green bead, and then the beads behind, because they're converged in front of them, are doubled. What is interesting to know is understanding which if they say they're suppressing, okay? So if they're looking at this green bead, okay? And they say that the left side is suppressing in front of the bead, then you can kind of know what, what side is suppressing. It's their left eye, right? But if they say that the string is suppressing on the right side behind the bead, you have to understand that's still the left eye. That's the line that the left eye is taking, okay? So the Brock string really gives me the feedback as I'm doing this, what's suppressing, what's not suppressing, where they're aligned at, where they're not aligned at, are they seeing diplopia, are they not seeing diplopia, okay? The challenges that are unique in all different types of patients, okay? as well as it's affording them a very clear, concrete way of seeing how their eyes are working and then a way to remedy their underlying issues, okay? So over and over, we talk about it's not the activity, okay? It's the action. It's the, if we think about motor alignment, that means it's muscle movement, right? Muscles don't move themselves. Muscles have to be controlled and moved by the brain. The brain sends the electrical impulse. The electrical impulse causes the muscle to do what it's programmed to do, okay? So we know that it's all about neuromuscular control. This gives them the feedback to know if their neuromuscular control is off or if they try to engage it, what it does in relationship to what they're seeing, okay? So a patient that has difficulty with converging might have a great deal of trouble getting there. Oh, we have more people joining us, welcome. 
they may have more trouble getting their um, bead on the X in front, okay, on the, on the bead that's closest, especially without strain or for long periods of time. So whenever you're doing an activity, remember, I love how Dr. Sanit always put it. He said, always go to where they're at and take them to where you want to be, okay? So I was a terrible CI. So when I when I was a patient, I would my break point was like 32 inches out. So if you put the Brock string up and put that bead eight inches away from my nose, it was struggle. It was a hurt that it caused, you know, I felt like it caused pain. You know, I did not like it. So don't be afraid, depending on the diagnosis of the person that you're working with, go ahead and back that first bead out just a little bit so that they don't have that intense symptomatic strain and allow them to know where their eyes are and then gradually move that closer, okay? Somebody that has difficulty with diverging, okay? They may be able to get that close bead or that middle bead, but that far bead they're gonna have a little bit more problems with. So very good to know the diagnosis of your patient, know what their hindrances are, being able to help them, help them through that, okay? Now, before I get into the levels of the Brock string, a couple things I want to talk about, and I'm going to back up here just a little bit. Hopefully everybody can still see me, and I'll try to speak up so that everybody can hear me. One of the things you want to meet, remember is little things can matter, okay? So if the string is pointed out, know what level you want it at, okay? So if you have it too high, they're gonna be in what we call up gaze, right? If they have it too low, it's gonna be in down gaze. So you wanna make sure that if we think about it, if somebody just standing straight, they're looking out, their eyes are at a 20 um, degree drop, okay? So that's about 20 feet out. That's why we have infinity. So when you have them do the Brock string, make sure that you have it just right at nose level and just slightly just lower as you go out. So it's the natural path of their eyes. That's at least where you're going to start primary gaze. And then from that, you're going to go into all the other gazes and, and we'll talk about that. The other thing is watch their posture. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't show, I don't have the camera to where I can show everything, but I have seen people Oh, some have to go. Well, uh, hope you catch you later. Okay. Um, I have seen ones that they'll have their shoulders turned one way, their head turned another way, their hips cocked one way, their feet crying across underneath them. And so their whole body is going all these different directions. Well, the body, if we think about it as the tripod, I'm trying to hold the camera still. And then we're trying to teach them to know where they're looking in space. Well, they're not gonna know where they're looking in space unless they know where they are in space. And if you have your head going one way and your shoulders going another way and your lower body going another way and your feet going opposite ways, that's gonna complicate the body, okay? That's gonna complicate the brain. It's not gonna know where it is in space, okay? So make sure that they're standing comfortably, shoulder, um, feet shoulder width apart, bend their knees a little bit. You don't want them passing out on you like they're in choir. So make sure that they have that good posture, okay? And then we're going to talk a little bit about um, once they see it. Well, we can go ahead and do it now. So when they first hold that string up to their eyes, I look to see if they have a head tilt, okay? Or if they hold it towards one eye or towards the other eye. And make sure that they're getting it within the center point. And then I will have them look at the middle bead. That way, I know that they have a, a two beads in front. And I'll ask them, are those two beads level or is one higher than the other? And so most of the time, they'll look at that middle bead and they'll say, well, the left one's higher than the right one. And I'll say, okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to just kind of lean your head left or right, okay, left or right. And I want you to balance those out because we're trying to get their oculocenter, okay? We're trying to make sure that their eyes are level and centered on that, on that string. So once they get that, then I'll ask them, now is one bead, does it feel like it's closer or farther than the other? Or maybe it looks more real than the other one? And they'll say yes. And I'll go, okay, now I want you to turn your head like you're shaking it. No, but very slowly. 
until both of them look at the same distance and the same reality. So this is just kind of some of the hygiene of it, making sure that everything is lined up. Their body's lined up, now their head's lined up, and now their eyes are lined up so that they have their best way to do this. It's important because if you just let them go any way they want, they're making adaptations, okay? And our goal is to help them not to make adaptations, but to have really good binocularity skills. All right, so the first stage is just X on each bead. They're looking at the first bead, then they go to the second bead, and we just call these bead jumps. And so I'll be there and I'll call it out. I'll say, go to green, go to yellow, go to red, and then notice where the X is, okay? If the X is in front of the bead that they're looking at, and we're gonna cover this, they're a little bit exophoric. If the X is behind where they think they're looking at, they're a little exophoric, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more on that. Um, but really feeling the control and having them be able to tell you, oh, I jumped to the closer bead. I felt my convergence flex. I felt the tension. Oh, I diverged to the far bead. I felt my eyes relax. So really being able to understand the feeling of convergence or the feeling of divergence. Then we'll do head tilts, okay? So being able to, and I'll call it flying the airplane, right? So they're on the middle bead. They have the two beads that are diplopic in front. Can they tilt their head and watch as that goes and still keep them real? So we're still firing all our systems. Prism jumps, this is one that I do maybe later on, okay? And we'll just add a little bit of low base in or low base out and see where their X jumps to. And then can they correct it? Can they get it back on so that they can really quickly recover and point their eyes in space where they want, when they want, okay? Then we'll just kind of precursor to bug, bug walk is can they put their X on the bead, but can they put their X in the middle between the beads, okay? And then bug walk is kind of the, the, the one that we really use for that final control that they really have it is they look at just maybe start with a bead, but pretty much getting to where it's just a string and they just get that X and then they slowly diverge that X out to the end and then slowly converge that X back to the beginning. And the, the key word there is slow, okay? So I tell my kids, okay, I want your bug to you know walk down the string and one little boy, I was like, how did that bug do? He goes, well, he goes, it was kind of a grasshopper. It kind of jumped from one to another. And I remember this, especially on, on converging in, it was like it'd get stuck and then it'd jump, okay? We want nice, smooth vergences, nice, smooth out, nice, smooth in. And so I try to get them to take 30 seconds to go down the string and 30 seconds to come up the string until they can control their eyes each and everywhere. So it should be slow and it should be controlled. All right, so exophoria, it often presents on the Brock string as a patient telling you that they're looking at the bead, okay? So if I'm using this green bead, they tell me, yep, I'm looking at the green bead. And I say, that's great. So where is your X? And they'll say that the X is slightly behind the bead, okay? So this is a time when where they think they're looking, okay, at the bead, but where they're actually aligned is not the same place, okay? So the brain thinks it's looking in one place, but the actual mechanics, okay, the biomechanics, the eyes themselves are aligned differently, okay? So they're out of calibration. Now, why do they still have one bead? Why is it double? Well, we do have what's called Panem's fusional range, right? So there is some slop in the system. So even though they're slightly behind the bead, they're still able to keep that bead single, okay? Esophoria is just the direct object. They're looking at the bead and they say, yep, I got one bead, but you ask them where the string uh, X is and they're slightly in front, okay? So this is a mismatch, okay? A mismatch between the eye alignment and where the brain 
thinks that it's looking, okay? This is gonna cause, a, this is gonna be a effect, right? Um, it's gonna affect accommodation, it's gonna affect stereo, it's gonna affect um, strain, okay? If somebody is esophoric, then they're converged more than they need to be, right? Excuse me, sorry. So their system, apologize, I need a drink. Their system is actually working harder than it needs to be because they're converged in, they're tighter than they need to be. Exophoria, they, they may be a little bit relaxed, okay, than they need to be. So we can kind of work on that. So to work on this, I use a lot of localization. So going back to bead jumps, put your eyes on the green. Now, touch the green. And the way that I do it is first is all within arm's length. Okay, so closest bead, middle bead, far bead, far bead would be with my arm extended because that's how we learn. We first learned as little babies as far as our arms could reach and how we could bring in. So that was very, very important to us, okay? So then once they've mastered that, okay, I think it was Dr. Scott Lewis, um, he, he really helped me to understand that if we can calibrate within arms distance, okay, then that's the calibration they're gonna use for beyond arms distance, okay? So if they don't know where they are in space or where things are in space within arms distance, they're not really gonna know where it is outside of that. But once they progress and they're really good using their finger, then I'll move the beads back. Maybe the close beads stay close so that they still have that convergence and that flexibility between the two. Then I'll give them a dowel or some something to reach with, a yardstick, and then have them localize on those far points coming in and going out. Always moving the bead because you always want it to be visually guided, not motor response, okay? So it's not muscle memory. Oh, I touched it. Oh, I was slightly off. Okay, where did I go? Muscle memory. Okay, there I got it. No, you want to move that bead so it's always where do my eyes say it is? Where do my eyes say it is? Now does my brain tell my muscles where it is, okay? So moving that, it's very important. Also, make sure that as you're doing this, okay, so they've got their string out there and they're working on it. When they come up to that bead, I tell them it's kind of like a dolphin. If you've ever seen a dolphin come out of a pool and hit the ball that's hanging up above the pool, they come straight up, right? they don't come from into place and then make adjustments, okay? They come straight up. So when they touch, they have to come underneath that bead and come straight to where that bead is. Very important for localization. So in these things, all this, what are we trying to do? Get their eyes there, get them close to it, where they are. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read this. I don't know if it's too small, but when there is a mismatch between the eyes are actually pointed and where the brain thinks the eyes are pointed, this is always a problem. This is almost invariably the fundamental cause of stress symptoms and one of the most important dysfunctions that you as a therapist are trying to resolve. Most of all, visual problems stem from this fundamental disagreement. The patient must have their eyes and their brain in agreement about where they are in space to feel comfortable and in control of their visual system. So in the foundations of fusion, that's why motor alignment and the Brock string are so important is that's how we're going to calibrate what their eyes see and what their brain perceives and then where in space they can perceive things to be. So very important. Conclusion. Well, before we totally want to awaken both eyes, okay, so um, especially if you're talking about anybody with a shrewd business, okay, we want to make sure that they have the ability to align them close enough to achieve fusion. So we've used gross luster, peripheral fusion, all those different things to get that peripheral glue, that magnocellular, um, you know, working strongly. But now we want to begin to remember that we want to get these eyes aligned so that one's not off when both eyes are on, okay? So we want to get that motor alignment. And then really remember the ocular motor and eye alignment, they are neuromuscular coordination actions. 
and that the brain must be involved and in control. And then it is the patient that must understand that what they do is affecting the outcomes. If you just put a string up in front of them and have them look at the beads and they go green, red, yellow, green, yellow, red, and they're like, yeah, 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 that's not the activity. They have to understand, did their eyes converge? Did their eyes diverge? Did it feel different when they diverge? Did it feel different when they converge? Where in space, localization. So all these things are very important. So this is the next little building block in our foundations of fusion. And I hope that it was helpful to you. If you have questions, I'll stick around here and look at, listen to the, the chat and see if I can answer them. Or you're always welcome to call me. Um, anytime, or you can email me anytime and be happy to clarify anything. So open it up for any discussion. I really appreciate everybody that's come. We had, I think, over 56 people. So this has been the largest one yet, and it's very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you, Juliet. So um, Tina asks if there's any formal VT training from beginning to end that you recommend. So of course, uh, I am part of Emergent. Emergent pays me to put these on and I, I really appreciate it. Um, so we do have the Emergent course. It's a one-on-one -on -one course. You can find it on our, our website. We're glad to help you with that. It is a great introductory course. You'll go through a lot of different things. And then of course, you know, one of my greatest heroes and mentors was, were, were the Sanets. So anything from Linda Sanet as a therapist and then anything from Dr. Sanet, but there's many doctors out there. I, I, I would hate to start saying all the different names because what I've found in this VT community is I've learned something from everybody, okay? So really talk to your doctor and see some of the different ones that are out there. Um, old COVD programs, you know, the iHeartVT is another one. So there's there's great great activities out there and great training. So Juliet, um, I want to clarifying on that. Most of the time, especially if I'm working with an esotrope, I will patch the esotropic eye, okay, but have it with that clear patch so that I can see it. And then on their good eye, I'll bring it from their periphery and bring it across until the great good eye is tracking it. And then as soon as I see that that um, isotropic eye that is under the patch starting to want to engage, that tells me that that's where they're firing, okay? And so it may be like four or five inches off of their nose and it just, there'll be a spot where it comes across. You'll see that the good eye is working and then all of a sudden, you'll see it, yeah, when you see it engage, you'll see that little flicker, boom, you know that they're working together. And I'll actually, it's not a quote unquote binocular activity, but I am firing the binocular of that patch die. So Jen, um, great, great. So whenever we do the Brock string, I always do it by a whiteboard. And so I'll ask them, you know, what do you see? And if they have struggles telling me what they see, I'll give them a marker and say, can you draw it on the board? And so they'll go over the board and they'll draw circles for the beads and lines. And really it's a great thing because I've had them, um, you know, this is not the simple stuff but I've had them draw one parallel line and then a separate parallel line, okay? So they're like not even together. And so it's really a good way to have them describe by drawing it out. Okay, um, Joel. So the Brock string, depending on your patient, one, it can be very boring for young people. They don't like to do it very long, but it also can be very stressful, okay? So it's kind of a lot. So Brock string for me was like a three to five minute activity, unless I had really good engagement and a really good personality to work with. 
And I never sent Brock string home with somebody that had strabismus until I was really sure what their stability was on diplopia. Okay. Um, convergence insufficiency, those and everything else, then yes, I would send that um, doing for homework. And then it's just through the stages. So at the beginning, Brock string, you know, bead jumps, all these different things. They may take Brock string home multiple weeks, but it would be different activities. Good questions. Thank you. So Tabitha asks, what are some of the tricks you use for patients that are over converging the farthest bead? Okay, so they're they're um, as they're diverging, they're not quite getting out there. They're esophoric, or maybe they they have a little bit of divergence insufficiency. Um, one of the best things is localization, localization, localization. Okay, so getting them with a, a wand or something to reach out and touch where they're looking at and then being able to take that and move it farther, okay? So even you can take a, a dowel, okay, a long dowel, have them hold it where it's pointing towards them and they look at it and then slowly they, they begin to rock it back, rock it back, rock it back, and then push it farther, 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 farther out from them so that they get used to that divergence activities, okay? All right. Well, thank you all. Um, that's going to conclude our, our session for today. And we'll let you know in June um, when it comes out. And then um, when you do that, we'll, we'll hopefully be on the new program platform. And so we'll be able to see your face and actually hear some of your voices. Okay. And yes, that, that bilateral conditioning. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great evening and everybody keep safe. God bless.